Please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Uh, the market, which continues to hold on to gains, uh, it's uh, century plus on the Nifty today. That's the kind of day that we've got. So let's get some last half an hour calls going. Ashwini and Mitesh are with us. Ashwini, I mean, no let up whatsoever. The bulls have such a stronghold. So what would the last half hour trades be? See, we've just hit, uh, you know, fresh highs on Bank Nifty. I think even right now for the next, uh, you know, 20 minutes and maybe tomorrow, uh, you could still buy into the bank nifty because once uh, you know this previous high gets taken out a lot of strategic shots get into trouble and particularly this time you know this bank nifty move is not just based on one uh, you know uh, private sector banks or psu banks it's kind of a, a move with a tailwind so my sense is next 15 20 minutes if we hold on to current levels we could see around 40 50 points uh, sort of upside and uh, now, you know, even private banks are coming in. So, uh, Indusind Bank is a buy uh, with a stop of 1970 target of uh, 2020. HDFC, not HDFC Bank, is a buy with a stop of 2020 uh, target of 2080. And Bank of Baroda, which was down like 1.8% uh, or rather uh, two and a quarter percent, is now coming back. It's almost shaved off. Uh, uh, you know, 1% worth of losses that we, we can buy going into tomorrow. So the good thing is that stocks have corrected banking stocks and they have come back from the lows. So that way, uh, I think Bank Nifty also Nifty are buys because fresh momentum is visible as we go into close. Okay, right. Uh, so those are the calls that you have. Uh, buy today, sell on Monday. Mitesh, what about you? What would be on your list now? I have two buy calls as well. Uh, Mid-cap stocks, Gati looks like breaking out of a pattern. So buy with a stop at 93 for targets of 104. And uh, Chini is a buy with a stop at 68 for targets of 75. Okay. All right. We will take a quick break on that note. And we'll also thank Mitesh for being with us on the show today. We are counting down to the, la <clears throat> the last 15 minutes of what has been a good day and a good week of trade. So I was just trying to sort of, uh, you know, gauge how the week went by. And it's been... <clears throat> A really good week actually uh, for the bulls. If you just look at the top nifty gainers this week, you've uh, what's stopping just the charts is ICICI Bank ahead of its numbers up almost 11%. ITC posts its numbers up about 11% this week, and SBI up almost about 10 odd percent or so. Uh, some comments coming in there from Siam with respect to the ongoing uh, trucker strike, eighth day now. And there's no signs of clarity on the breakthrough. They say that this is an unprecedented crisis, the kind of trucker strike that we're seeing. And it is affecting the movement of vehicles and components supply because of the strike. Uh, Dipan, uh, as they say, you know, when it rains, it pours. And for a company like Ashok Leyland, it's just been pouring bad news one after the other. The business is still strong, but, uh, you know, there's so many of these regulatory issues that are affecting the uh, overall sector. You think this is a good time to buy in adversity or would you stay away? Well, I think if you have a really long term view, like three to five years or so, and deep pocket uh, investor may look at uh, Ashok Leland, but I think uh, for the time being, there's just far too much uncertainty surrounding the stock, and we are seeing a, a good bit of revival as far as mid-cap stocks are concerned. So many new opportunities do open up, and as investors, we do tend to compare uh, returns and risk, risk return profile as well. So on that count, I think Ashok Leland may be given a miss at this point of time, but Always keep it on the radar because no doubt I think last few years they've done great uh, work in terms of gaining market share, improving the product line, uh, extending the distribution, working on exports as well and delivering a good set of numbers at times when the industry was going through a challenging period. So whenever we see overall revival in the uh, industry per se and little less uncertainty on the uh, government policy fund, I think I should, then I should again start to move up. But for the time being, I think it's better to just wait and watch. Okay, uh, all right. By the way, the move on ICICI Bank is nothing short of uh, breathtaking. We're looking at 3% gain. So yesterday, 4%, 3% today. This week, actually, the stock has put on almost 10.5%. That's the kind of buildup that you're seeing uh, ahead of the earnings. And if the earnings are uh, inspiring, what is largely expected is that asset quality trends should be stable. We anyway had a very high slippage number last time around, so maybe uh, it should be a little better from here on. So let's see, it's a very exciting evening lined up ahead for uh, uh, all the ICICI Bank shareholders for sure.
But for the time being, let's welcome in our next guest on the show, Gautam Trivedi, co-founder and managing partner of uh, Napin Capital is joining us on the phone line. Uh, Gautam, good to have you on. We want to discuss the market, but before that, uh, just your thoughts on everything that's been happening in telecom. Uh, Bharti's numbers, mm -hmm. while optically the profit uh, number looked better because of the extraordinaries, you know, one has been talking about a lot of stress remaining on the balance sheet. Uh, for instance, their uh, operating free cash flow turned negative, the gearing is slightly higher, and ARPUs are still under pressure, both for Jio and for Bharti. How do you look at the sector, and would you look at any kind of a contrarian call on telecom? You know, I think that's a that's a sector that we've been uh, staying away from for the past about almost three years now, and I think at this point uh, they wouldn't it wouldn't be uh, advisable to even look at the sector at least for the next couple of years. Uh, if you look at Geo's own network utilization, it's only 20% on an aggregate basis. So uh, you know, while the the incumbents are complaining about Geo and Geo's uh, pricing, the fact is they had uh, over four years to prepare. For Geo's entry, and you know, uh, seem to have been completely caught, un you know, unaware <clears throat> of uh, uh, the, the the tariffs. So I think, in reality, I think uh, uh, this is a sector I would not uh, look at at least for the next few years. Okay, you wouldn't even look at Reliance Industries as a stock because if you look at Rel Geo's performance, I mean, last quarter was good. This quarter, there's an expectation that profits will rise to almost 700 to 750 crores versus about 510 crores last quarter. Uh, subscribers have risen 15%. So on Reliance Industries, on the stock itself, don't you think Geo could be the trigger going ahead or do you think it's already in the price? No, I think Geo will be the trigger going ahead. And I was talking specifically about standalone uh, uh, telecom companies. I wasn't sure. referring to RIL. But I think the one fact which most of these uh, incumbents have completely missed out on, if you look at the history of Reliance Industries as a company, any product category that they've gone into, they've made that product a mass market product they brought down prices substantially, which has significantly benefited the end consumer, whether it's plastic, whether it's polyester, whether it was voice telephony with Reliance Infocom back in uh, 2004, to late 2003, uh, 2004. And they've done the same thing and redefined the business, uh, you know, with respect to uh, data. So, you know, when you said earlier that uh, uh, there's pressure on uh, uh, ARPUs from Geo, the Geo's redefined the ARPU business and, and, and redefined ARPU in a sense, in this country. So I think if people are expecting that ARPUs will start inching up anytime soon, I don't think that's going to happen, given the fact that utilization of the network is only 20%. Sure. And uh, Gautam, uh, adding to that mix is uh, the big merger, which is finally going to be true. <coughs> the regulatory permissions are in. Vodafone idea. Um, how do you think that changes the pitch? You know, honestly, I think this merger was required for the respective survival of the two companies. And, uh, you know, if you look at the absolute math behind, uh, uh, you know, the total debt, for example, I think the total debt, combined debt of the two companies is one like 14,000 crores. The net debt to EBITDA is about 7 to 8, 8x, which means their interest alone is about 10 to 11,000 uh, uh, crores per annum. Again, these are purely back of the envelope calculations, which amounts to almost 90% of EBITDA. So the fact is, by the merger of these two companies, you know, I don't see really how the network improves because they have a huge capex going forward for the, for for their 4G network, which you know for both both companies is uh, pretty insignificant right now. Secondly, uh, I think starting sometime next year, the world's going to focus on 5G. So while these guys are looking at catching up on 4G and putting in having to put in more capex, which the balance sheet today doesn't seem to suggest they can because a lot of their a lot of the synergies only kick in basically from year three and year four so as a result i am at a loss to understand how will they fund not only just the existing 4g capex but as and when 5g becomes a reality which is supposedly next year in fact i just came back from the us and uh, you know the, most of the telcos there are talking about launching 5g sometime next year mm -hmm. so that that's really a big concern for me that will these two companies be able to uh, have uh, any free cash flow to do a significant more capex Okay, when is 5G coming to India? That's the multi-million dollar question, right? Gautam, thanks so much for joining us uh, and giving us your view. So stay away from the telecom space. There's plenty of uh, pressure there. Competitive intensity has picked up, and especially for incumbents like Bharti. Let's do one thing. Let's take a short break. More market talk lined up on the other side. Still going good for the market. We have about uh, 10 minutes left before the day comes to an end. So looking good today, all the indices, uh, Sensex, the Nifty and the Midcap Index, strong advance decline ratio. It is a strong Friday, no other way of putting it. Ashwini, I just wanted to draw your attention back to the duo 
uh, SBI and ICICI Bank. Clearly, the hope rally, the move is on. And if we get confirmation, then we've discussed this. I mean, then this could go, you know, sort of perhaps much higher. But between the two stocks, where is the risk reward better if you want to get in now? ICICI Bank and State Bank. See, risk reward is great for the next, you know, possibly 20 percent because State Bank is hardly at its 200-day moving average. So is ICICI Bank. So, you know, if things have turned around, then there is going to be a large rally. Then, you know, ICICI Bank will not hang around 300. It will probably be more like 380, 400. Similarly, you know, State Bank will easily cross its, uh, uh, you know, recap day high, etc. So then it's a long uh, way higher because uh, what is the stop? Recent lows, 260 on ICICI, hardly similar levels at State Bank. So 30, 40 rupee risk and upside could be 100 rupees. So there is uh, no problem with risk reward. Okay, that's the update of, from the HDFC AMC IPO. It was expected to be very strong because of all the positives that HDFC AMC has going for itself, being number one in both uh, you know, equity AUM growth, investors, inflows, etc. Uh, total subscription 57 times. The QIB portion is 148 times. Retail has gone up about 5.9 times. This is just as of 3 p.m., so it's looking really strong. Uh, Dipan, what are your thoughts on this? You know, we've it has a long track track record of uh, sort of alpha generation, a very strong distribution network. Uh, uh, the going is pretty good for uh, this, this IPO. Uh, for retail investors, what would the recommendation be? What's the expectation post listing? I think any retail investor getting a decent allocation should consider himself lucky given the kind of oversubscription which is there. And then, you know, I think remain invested. This clearly a nice secular growth story with strong management, good brand and uh, in an industry which is going to favor tremendously because of financialization of savings. So I think best to remain invested and look for adding into uh, further to the holdings post listing whenever there's a decent correction or if the uh, you know, kind of valuations sort of narrow from what they are anyways quite richly valued. So one needs to keep that in mind. But nonetheless, I think it's a stock which should remain, uh, one should remain invested for a long period of time and post listing also, I think uh, over the next two, three years or so, one could get good returns. Uh, from HDFC AMC. Okay, well, but as Deepan says, you've got to be lucky to get any allotment looking at those oversubscription numbers. Sampat Reddy, uh, the Chief Investment Officer at Bajaj Alliance Life Insurance is also joining in. Let's get him into the conversation. Sampat, let me ask you the same question. You know, the last one year, we've seen new uh, parts of the financial universe come on the listed street. Insurance companies, asset management companies, uh, how do you view some of these listed businesses and are they part of your portfolio? Yeah, I mean, uh, they're all good businesses, especially, you know, the general insurance and life insurance also, the asset management companies, you know, they're pretty much good businesses and, uh, you know, there are a lot, you know, the penetration levels are very, very low in India and most of the private players are, you know, relatively uh, recent entrants into this space. I think they have a very long potential to grow. So, I mean, we, you know, I think we like that space very well in the financial services. Okay, we're just counting down to a close now, uh, so it's been pretty good. Ashwini, I just wanted your quick thoughts on a couple of these big gainers for this week. We've spoken about ICICI Bank at length, uh, ITC is the big gainer too, about 10% higher, and SBI, uh, about 10% higher. You know, in the morning you were telling us about how some of these contributors, ITC, ICICI Bank, they've now started to perform. Um, do you think we could see follow-on trades even next week? Well, that will require tailwind and tailwind if if it comes from ICICI Bank. You know, corporate lenders have just started out. And ITC, again, under-owned. Uh, nobody was really interested like uh, two days back. So again, 325, 330 is a point where I, ITC can take you to. And that will give time to Bajaj Finances, T TCS, and all those you know all-time high stocks to relax. And while the market is able to move up from here, so that way, you know, the underowned groups are now uh, finding buying, which is a big positive. Mm, fair enough. Two and a half minutes to go before the day and the week closes out. Uh, Sampath, uh, what are the pockets in consumer that you are backing now? I mean, which way are you playing it? Are you looking at perhaps auto? Are you looking at FMCG staples? What pocket of consumer do you like? 
we've been liking both auto as well as fmcg you know even though the valuations are slightly on the higher side in the consumer fmcg side uh, you know given that the uh, good earnings growth which is happening currently today i think you know we've been liking volume growth has been very very good for the most of the you know consumer staples and uh, we've been liking that uh, space and also within the auto also we've been even liking the you know the both the you know passenger cars as well as two wheelers and even the commercial vehicles also you know I mean most of the given the stocks have corrected quite uh, quite a bit and we've been liking that entire space as well so if, apart from that uh, you know quite a few auto ancillaries also you know like for example even tire sector also you know the valuations are very very attractive given that very good brand and you know reach and uh, good cash flows in this sector uh, i think we've been liking that uh, space also Okay, just a minute to go. So let's uh, try and wind up the day's trading action. It's been a good day of trade. Uh, no two ways about that. A good week as well. And you have, um, you know, a lot of stocks that have aided it today. The stock of the day undoubtedly has to be ITC. Uh, it's uh, powered ahead today, up almost about five odd percent, and closes with huge gains. I say, say, bank is up ten percent this week and is up about one and a half percent today ahead of its numbers later in the evening. But the bigger contributors, a lot of Tata Group stocks did well today. So Tata Motors, Titan, Tata. Steel all up in the green. Tech Mahindra up about two or percent, and some of the um, oil marketing companies played for a bit of a comeback. So IOC, HPCL, etc. up about two, three or percent. Even two wheelers made a bit of a comeback this week. So Aisha Motors, Bajaj Auto, and Hero Motor Corp all three closed in the green, up about two to three or percent. And Reliance Industries ahead of its numbers later this evening is up almost about one and a half or percent. On the downside, Dr. Reddy is under pressure, down about two and a half percent. TCS has come in for some profit taking. Maruti Suzuki is down about one percent. It has been subdued post its uh, moderate miss in the margins yesterday. M&M is under pressure, down about three tenths of a percent. So all in all, good day of trade, good week of trade rather. Absolutely, yeah, Sonia. Even on the mid cap side of the market, I think that was the other telling point of trade this week that mid caps are beginning to participate. Uh, and that was evident today in the market breadth and the way the index is closed, about 1% higher. Let's come to the movers and shakers. Uh, uh, Motilal Oswal, 7% on the higher side. Reliance Capital, uh, well spun India after the numbers came out, 10% higher. Rights ahead of the numbers, about 16% higher on that stock. Again, more a lot of this was, of course, earnings reaction. So Philips Carbon is managing to go home with gains of almost 6 to 7% uh, on the upside. If you're talking about good earnings, then you have to count in all the burgers. So uh, Westlife Development, uh, following on the heels of Jubilant Food Works with very strong same-store sales growth, 11% up on that stock towards close. Uh, we had a decent show from Heritage Foods as well, decent operational performance this time, 5% up on that stock. Biocon's numbers were liked by the street, 5% up there. SBI Life, Alembic, it's a long list of uh, movers and shakers on the upside actually today. And some non-news movers, Ajanta Pharma moved higher because there is no EIR on one of their facilities that was issued. So no, no, uh, no Form 483, beg your pardon, on one of their facilities. So that worked really well for the stock. Uh, beyond earnings, if I talk about where else the momentum was evident, cement continues to be a very strong space. So India Cements has had a very strong show today. Gati about 7, 8% on the higher side. JNK Bank has put on about 8%. Castrol, NBCC, PFC, it's a long list of winners. Very strong Friday for a lot of mid caps. On the downside, of course, you do have some disappointments. And in terms of earnings, Chola Mandalam perhaps will stand out. That stock has seen a dropping 5% down after numbers. Uh, IRB, Infra, NIIT, are, and Arvind are some of the other uh, noticeable uh, movers on the way down. But otherwise, very strong market. And I think uh, a lot of the numbers, Sonia, that came in at least during market hours kept the momentum in the cheer intact for the mid-caps today. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, by the end of the week, uh, the index itself goes home with some handsome gains. So let's just pull up the weekly chart. The Nifty is up 2.5% this week. The Nifty mid-caps are up. Uh, the mid-cap 100 is up 4% this week. And if you're looking out for big sectoral gainers, the FMCG index has had uh, a very strong showing this week as well. Uh, Nifty Metals also, by the way, up almost about 6.5%. But um, Sampath Reddy and Ashwini Gujral are both with us. Ashwini, uh, after looking at the market closing and the move on individual stocks, any trades that you would advise for Monday or from the large cap space? Well, several interesting uh, stocks have broken out. Something like Madison, it hung around 280, 300. That's broken out, uh, closing at about 320. Also, uh, the two big trades, ICICI Bank, State Bank, ITC. So, you know, the uh, market is now moving towards the under-owned uh, group of stocks. 
So maybe your all-time high stocks may not perform as well. TCS has been down for four consecutive days. So that way you have to understand, you know, where the money is moving. Okay, fair enough. Um, Sambath, uh, then to sort of wrap things up, what are your key overweights in the market now? Uh, we've discussed some of the sectors like consumer and auto. Beyond that, what are you willing to back? And are you now looking to perhaps start buying into some of the corporate lenders, whether PSU banks or even private sector names like ICICI Bank? Right. So apart from the consumer, we've been liking the uh, retail banks, retail NBFCs. They do not really... Uh, you know, so much positive on the PSU banks and even the corporate lenders. If you look at the credit growth as such, you know, the growth is mostly, you know, completely retail led industry. Credit, credit growth is pretty much, I would say, near zero. So, and uh, I mean, it's obviously the, you know, the, when we are looking at, you know, the uh, industrial uh, uh, corporate lenders, it's more from a valuation point of view. I agree with that. But, you know, as of now, we still prefer to go with, the, you know, the uh, retail lenders where the long term growth is much better. And apart from that, we've also been liking the rupee, uh, rupee play. You know, the, because the rupees have depreciated quite a bit in the last four or five, five months, you know that I think is going to you know, show a good earnings growth, especially the IT services. You know we've been liking that uh, for a, quite a while, and probably even the pharma sector is also coming to a good value zone, and uh, that these are the sectors you know we've been liking. Okay, well thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, let's take a quick break on that note. On the other side of the break. Uh, as we await numbers from Reliance Industries, ICICI Bank and Bank of Baroda, we'll get to all the key expectations when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back here with Closing Bell. Now the trading day and the week might be over, but earnings are definitely not. In fact, this is a heavy Friday evening with a couple of index heavyweights lined up ahead. To start off with, of course, Sonia, I think Reliance is going to keep us fairly occupied with the, their numbers. And there's so many parts to the puzzle now that we have to look at, right? Yes. But, but broadly, uh, how are we I mean, anticipating these numbers to be? Okay, so let me just take you through the broad expectations. Uh, now, as we know, there are four key verticals, the pet chem business, refining, rel geo, and retail. Now, the pet chem business strength is expected to continue. Uh, the refining business is expected to be weak. Uh, this is similar to the trend we saw last quarter. Rel Geo profits are expected to rise compared to the 510 crores they saw last quarter. And the retail business, though, could positively surprise. Remember, that's what happened last quarter as well. Retail, of course, is a very, very small pie of the overall business. But let me take you through the bread and butter business. Overall, on a quarter on quarter basis, earnings are expected to be flat. Uh, that's because <clears throat> whatever growth we see in the pet chem business will be offset by the weakness in the refining business. So re re revenues up 6%. Revenues don't matter for oil and gas companies. So we'll talk about the margin performance. EBITDA is expected to go up by 1.8% and profits expected to go up by about 1.4%. Now, if you look at the pet chem business particularly, the pet chem volumes have been on the higher side this time around. We've seen a growth of almost 2.2% in pet chem volumes to 4.54 million tons. In fact, the graph will come up for you. It's been on a steady wicket on the upside if you see from 3.5 to 4.54 over the last five quarters. Uh, that's because they've ramped up production in two of their key units, which is the refinery of gas cracker and the PX units. Um, the refining segment will be weak. So uh, we're expecting, because Singapore gross refining margins have fallen to a seven quarter low, we're expecting uh, Reliance's gross refining margins to come to ten and a half dollars a barrel. It's actually been on a weak footing for the past few quarters, as you can see, and that will be the reason why the refining EBIT will slow down. Jefferies expects the refining EBIT to fall about 5% on a quarter on quarter basis at 5300-odd crores. Rel Geo's numbers expected to be quite strong. Uh, average subscribers have gone up by about 15% on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. Okay, all right. So we'll stand by and await those numbers. Uh, let's see uh, how they come out. Expected any time after 4 4 30. Now, as Sonia mentioned, Geo is expected to report a strong performance. Let's just go through the more granular details on the kind of uh, additions we can expect in terms of subscribers, data volumes, etc. Reema is here with that fine print. Reema? Well, first, the numbers. So, revenues will be higher by 3.5% on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. 
margins largely stable, maybe a positive buy, so 38.1% according to our poll. And profits too are likely to nudge higher to 567 crore versus 510 crore. Now for Geo, the biggest growth driver is the very strong subscriber edition, which is adding to their incremental revenue. So every month, uh, Geo adds close to about 9 to 10 million subscribers. At least that's been the trend for the last three quarters. So if that happens, this, this quarter we could see about 28, 29 million subscribers getting added and that will provide the revenue driver. What will offset it is the pricing pressure in the industry. So even Geo is not spared from it. For Bharti, we saw a 9.5% decline in the average revenue per user or ARPU, which you know, in simple terms you could say call it as you know pricing. Even for Geo, we are expecting a 10% drop on a sequential basis in pricing. So the key metrics to track will be the subscriber addition as well as the average revenue per user. Also, the company entered into the postpaid segment in May of this year and uh, they had entered with a plan of 199 rupees per month. So if there is a lot of offtake in that, it can help offset some of the ARPU pressure. So we will watch for traction on that if they give us any more details as well as on the Geo phone because the company is coming up with a lot of offers. There was an exchange offer as well announced uh, at the AGM. So attraction in Geo phone will also help the company on the whole. Okay, you can catch the Reliance Management Briefing on the Q1 numbers that takes place at 6.15 p.m. later today. So uh, do stay tuned into that. Of course, uh, the stock will react to its numbers on Monday. But let's quickly cut across to JSW Energy. They're addressing the media on their quarter one numbers. Whether, uh, we have our strong doubts whether that level of pricing at which the bids are being finalized is sustainable. So we uh, are waiting for the right time to enter into in, a, in this space in a big way, though we have made a small beginning as we informed uh, during the last quarter in quarter one, we have added 12.1 megawatt of uh, solar capacity, which is uh, within the, uh, under the group captive within the group companies. And uh, we are continuing with the, rather than participating in these uh, auctions where the pricing becomes a doubt with bilateral uh, arrangements within the group company as well as we are exploring the outside options also that uh, wherever it feels because we have a benchmark that us on certain returns we will like to explore the possibilities wherever we feel that we are comfortable with the returns which we have planned we will be definitely uh, going for uh, this uh, renewable capacity addition but uh, definitely we are working on that and we are hopeful that maybe in coming times we will be doing that as regard to what was informed last time that we will also be uh, entering into uh, solar PV modules and then uh, cell manufacturing facility uh, on 1st or 2nd of June, the way uh, China, the change which has happened, the China government has announced withdrawal of uh, the subsidies and the facilities which they were giving for the solar parks. Uh, and initially their capacity addition plan for the current year 2018 was in China was close to 53 gigawatt. It has been reduced to be, it has now been said it will be uh, sub 30 gigawatt. And with uh, in excess of uh, 100, uh, 122 in fact to be number gigawatt capacity in China, we see that uh, this uncertainty has resulted in a steep fall in the module prices. So whether uh, we go for the manufacturing or we import the materials, all those things keeping in mind, we are waiting for the right time and we will have a wait and watch approach both in terms of putting up the manufacturing facility or also going for the uh, solar capacity additions. As regard our performance uh, this year uh, in quarter one, in terms of uh, the PLF, uh, the load plant load factor with certain like our hydro capacity from 1st of April is 100% tied up under long term PPA with 200 megawatt addition which got effective from uh, 1st of April 2018 uh, with uh, Punjab our 100% of the hydro capacity is now tied up and uh, in thermal space we another development which has happened is one of our unit uh, which is the third unit two of the units have been under group captive in Ratnagiri plant the third unit is also now under group captive and uh, over a period of next uh, 18 to 24 months we expect that this entire capacity will be tied up. We have added uh, under group captive some uh, capacity additions. All right, that was JSW Energy. Right now we need to take a quick break. We'll come back on the other side with, uh, of course, all the commodity queues.
Welcome back. Let's take a look at the commodities as well because they have had a consolidating week. This one, we've seen the crude oil prices gain by almost a percentage point. And even as the US dollar kind of held on to its gains, we still saw some buying come back for the base metal prices as the US and European Union trade talks actually helped sentiments and averted a trade war, trade war at least between both of those economies. Ranisha Chanani is Head of Commodities and Currencies at Monarch Networth and she joins us to talk more about the strategies therein. Ranisha, hi, welcome. How would you look at the base metal prices to begin with? Because we've seen the US dollar uh, continue to be volatile as has been the case, but it really was the cues from the US and EU trade talks that actually led to some buying come in here. Are you still buying at these levels or are there other fundamentals that you would want to watch for? Hi Manisha, good afternoon. Yes, I think base metals have been outperformed this week. Uh, we have seen that copper has almost risen three, three and a half percent, and even nickel is uh, has risen around three percent this week. I think these both commodities have uh, strong fundamentals, and as US and EU trade talks have supported overall base metal pack, uh, the fundamentals for copper and nickel have been a bit more supportive. As we have seen some, uh, you know, uh, talks going on in uh, is called the mine for copper and for nickel. Also, we have seen some uh, steel demand that is coming in. So overall, I think still there would be a buy recommendation coming on from these levels. If copper sustains above 429, uh, buying could be initiated for the targets of 433. And for nickel, buying could be initiated at current levels around 940, with a stop loss of 930. And I'm expecting the targets like 955 in a day or two. Buying recommendations coming in for the base metal prices, but are you anywhere close to giving a buy when it comes to gold and silver? Or is this sector, is that you think could really be sideways, volatile and still weak? Uh, looking at current prices, I think I would be, uh, you know, staying uh, aside for the precious metal pack as today we have US GDP numbers and which is expected mm. to be very, very strong, uh, more than 4%. So I think there could be some, you know, more volatility that would be seen in evening session. But yes, I think some uh, dips would be supported. So buying on dips should be used as an uh, opportunity and as a strategy for precious metal pack, but not at current levels. So uh, anywhere, you know, silver around 38,000 is a good level to buy and even gold uh, anywhere around 29,500 to 600 is a good level to buy. These are the important support levels and I, I think prices would be you know, supported and uh, would rebound from these levels again. All right. So buying in base metal prices, but not so much in gold at these current levels. Some more dips perhaps could head you, help you make that decision. Ranisha, thank you so much for joining us and giving us your strategies on all of those metals. With that, let's slip into a very short break. On the other side, we will start, touch base with Steve Felder, who's MD South Asia, Maersk Line, and he will join us to talk about the impact of crude prices on containerization and, of course, shipping and freight. Welcome back. And when you look at the numbers, the India's global trade growth numbers are quite on the positive side. Also, when you look at the containerization trade, well, India stands very tall. Actually, this is the first quarter uh, in last eight, which is actually shown the best of results. When you look at the import numbers, they are at 16 percent and exports also growing at a healthy pace of 7 percent. Of course, the shipping and the freight industry has seen some impact from the crude oil prices. But overall, India numbers definitely are looking quite strong there. Let's get a handle of that in detail with Steve Felder, who's MD South Asia at Merce Klein, joining us on the show. Steve, hi, good evening. Good to have you. What is your sense, first of all, of the crude oil price rise that we have seen in this year and that's impact on the shipping business, really? I think it's been uh, quite difficult for, for containerized shipping. Uh, of course, it's a very high variable cost uh, for the industry. Uh, oil price or bunker fuel price, which uh, we use on our vessels, has increased uh, around 20% since the beginning of the year and around 45% since a similar period last year. So it's been pretty difficult and, and it's mean, it means that we've had to uh, uh, go back to our customers and of course uh, recover uh, uh, substantially more uh, from the customers. Mm -hmm. Steve, also, uh, as per your report, uh, the India containerized trade with the world has seen an uptick in the first quarter of 2018. What quarters or categories did you see growth really coming from? I think in India specifically, w India is 
quite uh, diversified both in terms of commodities and in terms of trading partners. Uh, so we're not overly dependent on uh, a single market or a single block. Uh, having said that, what we have seen is we've seen very good uh, trade upticks uh, with the Mediterranean. We've also seen very good uh, uh, boost in waste paper imports from Europe, and that's uh, largely due to China's uh, restrictions that they've imposed uh, at the beginning of this year on waste paper imports uh, into China. So uh, I think overall a, a very healthy picture. Uh, the trade grew quite substantially in quarter one versus the same period last year, 7% growth on exports and 16% uh, growth on imports. Mm, that is a good number. But Steve, how would you look at India global trade growth or the containerized growth vis-a-vis -vis the rest of global markets that you're working with? Well, India, if you look at containerized growth, India certainly stands out as one of those markets that is uh, fast growing. Uh, global trade last year in containerized terms grew at about 5% as per the IMF. Uh, this year, we believe as a group, uh, it will be slightly slower, around about 2 to 3%. Uh, India, for its part, uh, has been growing consistently for the past few years at around 8 to 10%. And that's, of course, off already a fairly high base. We see uh, that continuing in quarter one this year where uh, India grew 11% uh, overall import-export combined. So significantly above the global average. Hmm. Steve, also, uh, you know, the global trade concerns, we've seen uh, the consumers warring against each other in sense of trade tariffs between US, China, US, European Union, etc. So there have been lots of global cues to take in. And then, of course, India is has seen policy reforms. We've seen a GST come in. It's an election year as well. So on the backdrop of all of this, what is your sense? Will India be able to maintain the trade numbers going ahead? We expect uh, the momentum to continue. I think uh, unless there's something that's really unforeseen, we expect this positive growth to continue uh, unabated. Uh, there's certainly just a lot of natural broad-based momentum uh, in the import-export market. Uh, I think we've also seen some uh, government interventions such as the relaxation of intercoastal cabotage, uh, which bodes well for, for Indian importers and exporters. We've also seen ongoing uh, uh, progress on key infrastructure developments uh, to reduce the cost of logistics and improve the ease of doing business, such as Sagamala, Bharatmala, etc. So we still could see a continued positive momentum. All right, Steve, on that positive note, we'll let you go. So that really is the work coming in for Maersk. That in this year also, we are looking at India containerized growth at around 8 to 10 percent, which is vis a vis 2 to 4 percent of the total global growth. So clearly, India stands quite tall when it comes to those numbers there. But with that, that's all the time that we have on this edition of Closing Bell. After the bell comes up next.